This week on Jerusalem Dateline, Iran's nuclear program may have been set back by as much as two years by sabotage. Who's behind the attack? Plus, an NBA star wonders why Turkish President Erdogan converted the Hagia Sophia into a mosque. Turkey has enough mosques around that area, and they have not even have full. And an excavation uncovers Jerusalem's past from 2,700 years ago. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. A series of recent mysterious explosions inside Iran have left many wondering if these mishaps are sabotage against the Iranian regime. And one of these explosions is getting more attention from intelligence experts than the rest. The mysterious events range from a shipyard fire to a gas line explosion. While no clear evidence has surfaced regarding sabotage as the cause of all these explosions, Israeli investigative journalist Ronan Bergman says one clearly stands out at the Natanz nuclear facility. The bombing there, the explosion, the blast that destroyed the whole facility for the installment and um, balancing of centrifuges in Natanz was a direct result of a pre-planned sabotage. Whoever was behind that demonstrated, I think, the, um, the highest capability, nothing less than exquisite, of intelligence collection. Experts estimate the damage at the facility sets back Iran's nuclear program by as much as two years. An unknown group calling itself the Homeland Cheetahs claim responsibility, but might not be the only actor involved. In the New York Times, we have quoted a Middle Eastern intelligence source that said that Israel was behind this, uh, this blast. Bergman draws no connection between Israel and the Homeland Cheetahs, he suspects the Natanz attack could be part of a bigger U.S.-Israel plan. In another report, we indicated that there are American sources, together with Israeli officials, are thinking of a new policy towards Iran. So not just this specific incident, but a bigger policy that this sabotage is part of, a campaign of calculated operations, not trying to open war with Iran, but trying to send a message that Israel or the United States, or Israel and the United States, would not accept the continuation of the advancement of the Iranian nuclear project. He adds it's all part of a secret war between Iran and Israel and the U.S. going back more than 30 years since the Islamic Revolution in 1979. The war has already started. It's ongoing. It just, it's not happening in the battlefield with thousands of tanks and, and airplanes, but it's happening as war are happening in 2020 clandestine operations, secret operatives going undercover, smuggling explosives into sensitive facilities, cyber attacks, and everything that is happening in Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq. This clandestine war pits Iran's regional and nuclear goals against both Israeli and American attempts to do everything they can to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear bomb and dominating the Middle East. But the regime is also fighting the rise of COVID-19. So why is the virus being called a pandemic of hope? CBN's George Thomas explains. Whether it's the exploding coronavirus, mysterious fires at nuclear and military facilities, or protests, Iran's ruling Islamic clerics are facing unprecedented challenges as the regime tries to maintain an iron grip on the nation. The government executed a man it convicted of spying for the CIA and Israeli intelligence. Mahmoud Musavi Majid received that sentence for allegedly passing information to the CIA about the whereabouts of General Qassam Soleimani. The powerful leader was killed in a U.S. drone strike earlier this year. This is a regime that's facing really uh, a possible rebellion in the near future. Regime officials talk about it. And so... They're executing a lot of people to put fear into the public. The execution follows a string of mysterious fires and explosions around the country. On Sunday, fires broke out at a military installation near Tehran, a shipyard in Boucher, and a key power plant connected to Iran's Natanz nuclear facility in Isfahan. Similar incidents have happened across Iran since June. 
some pointing to Israel's ongoing overt and at times covert war against the Islamic Republic. Israel specifically is trying to stop the transfer of very advanced precise munitions to the regime's proxies like Hezbollah and also wants to slow down the Iranian nuclear program. This as President Trump reportedly gives the CIA green light to launch more offensive cyber attacks to cripple or destroy some of Iran's critical infrastructures. All this against the backdrop of ongoing government protests and a remarkable revival that's witnessing thousands of Muslims turning to Christianity in the midst of COVID-19. That's why we call this a pandemic of hope. Mike Ansari runs Mohabbat TV, one of the most popular Christian satellite channels in Iran. The ministry reports it is recording 10 times more online salvations than this time last year. We are registering around 3,000 professional decisions, personal decisions by Iranian Muslims to leave Islam for Christianity during this revival. Ansari says that's 3,000 people each month who've decided to follow Jesus Christ since the pandemic began in March. People in Iran are just not happy the way uh, their economy is going, the way uh, the government is robbing them uh, of their natural resources and exporting Shiite Islam to the neighboring countries. Um, so they just don't trust their government. The large number of people leaving Islam is causing a backlash against the church. Dozens of Christians have also been arrested and imprisoned for responding to the gospel message since March. During these critical times for the regime, uh, there's a tendency historically for the regime to really crack down on religious uh, communities like Christian commerce, and we see that today. Iran is one of the world's most dangerous places for Christians, yet Christianity is growing faster in Iran than in any other country in the world. George Thomas, CBN News. One major historic symbol of Christianity in the Middle East is the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. Once the largest church in Christendom, it was converted into a mosque for many years. And for nearly the last 100 years, it was a museum. But earlier this month, Turkish President Recep Erdogan converted it back into a mosque and on July 24th opened the Hagia Sophia to Muslim prayers. The move, criticized by world leaders, is seen as part of a wider vision by Erdogan to revive the Islamic Ottoman Empire. The criticism includes a major NBA star who Erdogan has personally threatened. Definitely broke my heart because I feel like it's one of Erdogan's games and it's up. I feel like it's completely pol politically motivated. Turkish citizen and Boston Celtic Enes Kantor told CBN News why he also objected to Erdogan's move. It's away from modern Turkey's secular roots. And also Turkey has enough mosques around that area and they're not even half full. So why would you convert another church to a mosque. A Muslim, Cantor is devoted to dialogue and reaching out across religious, ethnic, and cultural barriers. I feel sad for all my you know, Christians, my brothers and sisters out there because the Hagia Sophia was a world United Nations heritage site. So as a Muslim, I'm deeply pained by the decision. When I was in Turkey, I had so many Christian friends and they're actually one of the most humble and one of the most, you know, this kind of people I have ever met. For years, Cantor, a human rights advocate, has spoken out against Turkey's human rights record. Turkey is the number one in the world that put the most journalists in jail. That shows that there is no freedom of speech in Turkey. Religion or expression, uh, there is no democracy or human rights. And just because I talk about these issues, Turkish government basically declared me as a terrorist. I actually answered them back and said, only thing I terrorize is the basketball game. This outspokenness has cost Cantor and his family a price. His father has spent seven years in and out of jail. I get past threats almost every day. Yesterday, I actually posted a couple of them on my social media, but in America, I'm safe. But Turkish government put my name on Interpol. So it's just because I'm not an American citizen yet. If I live in America, then they can deport me back to Turkey. So I'm just waiting to be an American uh, citizen. Cantor becomes an American citizen next year. And for him, it's about speaking out for those unseen, and unheard. You guys know my story because I play in NBA. 
but there are thousands of stories out there their situation is way worse than mine that is one of the biggest reasons that i'm still spoken about what's happened in turkey just because there's so many people in jail right now waiting for help coming up a rare look inside a hezbollah terror tunnel discovered by israel defense forces Syria accused the Israeli Air Force of targeting sites near Damascus on the night of July 21st. A military official was quoted on state media saying Israeli jets had carried out the attack and the country's air defenses had downed most of the missiles. He said the attack caused material damage only, but later it was reported the strike also killed a major Hezbollah leader. And that led to fears Hezbollah may retaliate on Israel's northern border. The IDF mobilized more troops on the border to counter any threat. Here's a story we did recently about one of the weapons in Hezbollah's arsenal. It's well known that Hezbollah terrorists in Lebanon have more than 150,000 missiles pointed at Israel. A less visible weapon with dangerous potential is a network of attack tunnels running underneath the northern border. This is Zarit, a small agricultural community of 250 residents on the Israel-Lebanon border. Above ground, it's quiet and peaceful, but underground, Hezbollah was planning for death and destruction. We're standing in the tunnel right now and just a few feet from the Lebanese border. This tunnel is called Ramia, named after the village where the tunnel began. It was the most difficult for the IDF to discover. It's also the longest and the deepest, the equivalent of a 22-story building built underground. You can see the wind chair on the wall over there, electricity, communications, lighting, and there's a phone that was actually connected for the first day when we exposed the tunnel. The wire was still live. One of our guys jokingly picked it up and asked for anybody to answer on the other side. There was no answer. The workmanship you see here is all done by Hezbollah. This tunnel took years to construct and millions of dollars to build, much of it supplied by Iran. You can see the remains of a rail system that Hezbollah had in place, which is what they used in order to bring equipment up, basically, and also to take all of the debris and rocks and shift it out of the tunnel. This would attach to a, a, an, a, an electric drill, power drill, that would drill like this. And once it got to the end of the, of the, of the, of the cup itself, they would just pull it out knock the piece of uh, rock uh, off and then shift that piece of rock back. The size of this tunnel is impressive. It's large enough where hundreds of Hezbollah commandos could have come into Israel with a goal to kidnap or kill. Where we're standing now, you can see behind me, is the last and the highest point that this Hezbollah tunnel got. As you can see, it's only a few meters from ground level. This is the entrance Israel opened into the tunnel. IDF spokesman Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Conricus told us the tunnel runs almost a mile long and was nearly operational. Operational in the sense of Hezbollah actually having the ability to break out and then to run to the nearest Israeli community. There are two communities here nearby, less than six minutes running distance from where we are now. Tunnel warfare expert Daphne Richmond Barak says the value of this type of warfare is priceless for Hezbollah. The potential reward is, is a major one if only it succeeds because um, it neutralizes the, uh, so the, the te technological advantage of the Israeli army. For now, Conricus believes they have found and rendered all the border tunnels useless, either by destroying or filling them with cement. That doesn't mean that we have, even for one second, let down our guard and have stopped looking. In the meantime, this massive tunnel represents the persistent determination of Hezbollah to destroy Israel and the IDF's vigilance to stop one of Israel's greatest enemies. Up next, an archeological excavation in Jerusalem from the time of King Hezekiah from the Bible. An excavation conducted near the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem has uncovered a unique, massive archaeological site. It dates back to the time of King Hezekiah and the kings of Judah. 
And as CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl reports, the site seems to connect the old to the new. I am now standing between two of the walls of the major Iron Age structure that we've uncovered. Archaeologists say the site is one of the most significant recent discoveries from the 8th century BC. That's known in the Bible as the time of the kings in Jerusalem. Israeli archaeologist Benjamin Storchin tells CBN News these huge cut stones hold a key. The Bible mentions cut stones as Evan Gazit or Ashlar stones. Ashlar construction is one of the signs for archaeologists of major, major construction, government, administrative construction. The excavation is here in the southern part of Jerusalem. Behind me is the new U.S. Embassy. Archaeologists say it's ironic that this area served as an administrative center 2,700 years ago, and now it's home to an embassy. This site has three aspects that are unparalleled. The stamp seals, the monumental architecture, and the stone heap proves without beyond reasonable doubt the administrative nature of this site. Located about two miles from ancient Jerusalem, it appears the government managed and stored food supplies for the kingdom here. They also collected wine and olive oil, the tax payment of that time. Archaeologists uncovered more than a hundred unique seals on jar handles, many stamped with the ancient Hebrew word Lemelech, which means to the king or belonging to the king. When we talk about these stamps, they're not very common. To date, maybe we have about 1,300 that have been ever discovered in, in Israel. Here, 120 means that we're almost about 10% of all the handles that have been discovered. The site is dated to a turbulent time when the Assyrian king Sennacherib was trying to conquer the cities of Judah. Still, the excavation shows the site remained active with uninterrupted tax collection. Archaeologists also found human and animal figurines. The Bible says not to do idol worship, and it repeats it, and the prophets warn about this time and time again. The reason for warning is that they keep reverting back to the idol worship, um, and it seems like these were very common in every single household. One of the mysteries is a huge mound of flint stones that archaeologists believe covered a large building. But why build an artificial hill some 65 feet high and more than an acre and a half in length? It takes a massive amount of labor uh, to move these stones. Now, the top surface of it is smaller stones, but in the heart of the, the pile, you have massive boulders, which are not easy to move. Nearby, workers are uncovering the remains of a wide wall. We think these are looted elements, ancient looting, of a, of a monumental structure that still exists, maybe to some degree, under the pile. The discovery came during a salvage excavation conducted before the construction of a new neighborhood. Now plans are underway to integrate it so the old becomes a visible part of the modern local heritage. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Southern Jerusalem. Up next, Israel's new innovation to combat COVID-19 with a state-of-the-art way to wash your hands. We've been told from the beginning of this COVID crisis about the importance of properly washing our hands. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl looks at an Israeli innovation that will show you just how well you're doing. It's called Soapy, a smart hygiene device designed to change the way people wash their hands. So we're giving you the right environment to wash your hands and the right technology to do it. We're giving you feedback on how your uh, hand washing practice was. CEO Max Simonovsky helped start Soapy two years ago, focusing on India and other developing countries. Then word started spreading. We suddenly uh, started to receive inquiries from the developed countries like U.S. and Canada and England. The COVID-19 crisis led to even more interest, with 136 countries calling about the product. Majority of the, I would say, guidelines or advices about how to prevent yourself from being infected is about hygiene, sanitation, and social distance. Mm -hmm. And hand hygiene is on, on the top. This is the soapy machine. When I put my hands in, it gives me just the right amount of soap that I need. 
and gives me 20 seconds to lather my hands, making sure I get all the right movements, get in between my fingers, my nails, all the things I need to have clean hands. It's monitoring how well I've washed my hands and how well I'm rinsing my hands, and it gives me another 20 seconds worth of water to rinse them. All right, here we go. Let's see how I did. And you can see that we measured how you were lathering technique and how was your rinsing technique. And in, on the lathering, you had 13 out of the 20 seconds done perfectly. And on the rinsing, 17 out of the 20 seconds one were done perfectly. The result is 77%. According to experts, people should wash their hands up to 12 times a day, but most only reach about half that number. Maybe 5 to 7% of people washing hands properly. Even if you take those five, six times that you're washing your hands, most of them will be a bad washing cycle. By using facial recognition, the machine assigns a random number to each user. Simonovsky said it doesn't gather any information about you other than how you wash your hands. Then Soapy teaches you how to do it better. So you know right away where you can improve and how, what you need to improve to increase that result and make sure that your hands will be clean every time, everywhere, every day. The device is also good for the environment, using about 20 times less water. And the water is preheated to the right temperature, so we're also saving on electricity. Last year before the COVID-19 outbreak, Forbes magazine wrote, by gamifying hand washing, soapy might just save civilization. Currently, the machine is used primarily in healthcare, schools, and food preparation. Simonovsky adds they're working on a product for the public because hand washing just isn't as simple as it seems. It's a real science. And if you have a real science, then you need to have a technology to help you with that. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Rehovot, Israel. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time.